Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 620 of the podcast and it is Wednesday the 27th of April 2022 as I record this early as I am off on travels uh, which I'll talk about a bit more in my personal section. On today's show, I'm talking to Elaine Pofelt about tiny business, big money, which I hope will be interesting for you. We discuss how you can make more money without growing the size of your business and what systems and mindset you need to focus on in order to leverage your limited time. Elaine was also on the show back in episode 489, talking about the seven-figure, one-person business, if you want more. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing and book marketing news, well, Google Play Books has opened up their AI narration for audiobooks. So if you publish direct through Google Play or if you use Publish Drive or another service that uploads for you, and if you even if you use another service with Google Play, you can still log in and access your books that way. You can go in and claim your ebook for audio, links in the show notes. It is an easy process to turn an ebook into an AI narrated book. It will open this nice Uh, front end and you can go through each chapter. You can choose a voice from various different accents and genders. You can change the speed, you can adjust the text and edit pronunciation, which and it's really it's really easy to do. Now remember, oh it's also free. (laughs) So they really want people to do this. Although it's worth remembering that they are collecting data on how you're editing things. They're obviously training an AI engine, um, but I've read the terms and conditions. They don't have exclusivity on the content. They're also allowing you to download the MP3 files and upload and even sell elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, there are there are things to consider with this. So f- first of all, before <laughs> before I get angry emails, I wanted to make a few things clear. I have done a lot of shows on uh, AI and audio, but I advocate a stratification of audio rights and the creation of multiple versions of the same audiobook in different ways. And uh, so I narrate I narrate my own audiobooks for nonfiction and also for short stories. So for example, a thousand fiendish angels, I have a version narrated by me as JF Penn. I also have one narrated through Deep Zen by an AI male voice. So um, I'm going to do the same for your author business plan, which I've narrated. It's available as me, the human, and I'm going to use an American, an American voice, a female American, to narrate the AI version. So uh, I actually really like this voice. The voice I'm choosing is Mia, um, which I like. And um, so I think this is really important because while some audiobooks absolutely require human performance and adaptation, and there are definitely books that should only be read by humans, the massive amount of audiobooks out there, um, and in fact, for a lot of audio listeners like myself, we listen on 1.5 or 2. 2x speed or even more. Uh, we're some there are apps that get rid of uh, pauses and silence. <laughs> so some people just listen to content super fast, and I really don't think that um, AI narration makes that much difference in that case. I personally, I will continue to human narrate, but I will also use AI options to provide different voices and different price options to my listeners. I am definitely intending to price lower, but I will still. Uh, it's not going to be free. This is still my uh, IP. It's still the same content. So I'm going, but it, but the production process is cheaper. So, or free, well, Google has it for free. But yes, yeah, so I definitely don't think that this is replacing humans uh, for the art of narration. I think that's really important. This could definitely replace humans who are just reading stuff in a robotic voice. <laughs> 
because let's face it, there are humans who do this. But I know people who really want their textbooks in audio and that is not a performance, that is a read. So yeah, when you have your various thoughts about AI audio, consider that there are different types of audiobooks, there are different types of content, there are different types of listeners and buyers in the market. There are also a lot of books that would it would be great if we had more than just a certain type of accent and a certain language for. So yeah, AI narration is going to make things much more accessible, much more diverse. And yeah, I think it's, uh, uh, I've talked about before, the explosion of audio it, it, because of AI. Now, I also advocate clear labeling. So I have a digitally narrated sticker on my audiobook cover. And of course, it's also in the description. So we're not trying to um, trick anyone with AI. We are being very clear about that. So I think those things are all very important. So yes, on Google Play, you can download the files, you can upload elsewhere. But remember, (laughs) most services do not allow AI narrated audiobooks unless they have been published through an approved service. So I'm currently going through DeepZen for distribution to every audio platform except Audible. And so it is possible to publish AI narrated books on these other platforms, but uh, you have to go through a sort of approved um, service. And that does cost money. In terms of selling direct, absolutely, you can download your MP3s and sell through BookFunnel. I'm going to use PayHip for now. I'll probably use other services as well in the future. But I would expect that because this will probably create a glut in AI audio, there will be some emails and there'll be some cracking down on AI narration from established services. So, for example, you cannot upload these onto ACX. You cannot upload these onto Findaway Voices. Uh, There are lots of places you cannot upload these files. So please read the terms of service for wherever you're planning on uh, whatever you're planning on doing with this. I am going to do a longer solo episode on AI voice once my audiobooks are distributed so I can talk a bit about that process and that also once I've created some Google Play ones and I am going to do that too. In the meantime go check it out links in the show notes as ever. Now, the big story this week, if you are someone who uses Twitter, is Elon Musk buying Twitter. (laughs) Now, of course, it hasn't uh, definitely gone through. It'll have to go through various regulatory things. But uh, I'm not going to comment on whether or not I think it's a good thing, because that will make this my comment as partisan as the debate on Twitter, which is, uh, yes, lots of people disagreeing with each other on whether this is a good thing or not. But I wanted to talk about it because of the anger that has sort of blown up over this. And some people are saying they're going to leave Twitter uh, because they hate Elon Musk, but then they can't leave because they've invested so much on Twitter and they love it, but they're really angry. Uh, Other people are really pleased and think it's going to open up um, much more free speech. Some people think free speech should have its limits. Basically, there are lots of emotional reactions to it. But this is nothing new. And as I always say, (laughs) everything changes. And you cannot control these platforms. And the main point for authors and anyone else really is do not build your entire business on someone else's digital property. And you can equate that to every other platform out there. You cannot control what happens when something is out of your control. And that's when you get angry and rage at things until you come to the place of acceptance and you get on with changing the things you can control. Now, this was actually one of my lessons of the pandemic. I was so angry, so, so angry for a lot of that first year. (laughs) I was so frustrated uh, at, I mean, we all were, right? We were, we were worried. Um, we were afraid, but I was also angry. And a lot of the writing about the pandemic has talked about the stages of grief. And I know anger is one of the stages of grief. But then I was ill, and that was out of my control. And I learned a lot of lessons through actually having COVID quite badly. And I've been thinking about this a lot because I think this is the theme of my pilgrimage memoir, which I have talked about, and I'm still noodling about. But um, Uh, It's essentially, you know, the things that we can control versus the things we can't control and the acceptance. And so, yeah, I guess 
I want us all to think about what we can control, our sphere of influence, our locus of control, as they call it in psychology, and really consider what we have influence on. Now, of course, you can, you do have influence on your use of Twitter in that you can just turn it off. <laughs> you can just leave. That is about the extent of your control over their stuff. But you can make a decision in that way. Now, related to this, I've just finished a great book. It's called Imaginable, How to See the Future Coming and Be Ready for Anything by Jane McGonigal. So that is Imaginable. And again, I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, of course, I am a futurist and I love this stuff. But having a long term horizon does change your perspective on a lot of situations. Now, Jane provides lots of ways to think about the future and how you might simulate it, at least in your imagination. She says, it's better to be surprised by a simulation than blindsided by reality. So coming back to Twitter and Elon Musk, forget that it's Twitter and Elon Musk. Just think about your broader online ecosystem as an author. What if this thing had happened with another platform that you use? Let's not mention any names. (laughs) But what are you dependent on? whether that's financial dependence, emotional dependence, because let's face it, most most people on Twitter are not financially dependent on Twitter. In fact, probably 99.9% of people on Twitter (laughs) are emotionally somehow dependent on Twitter, not financially. So what companies and systems are you that dependent on, whether financially or emotionally? If something like this happens and it changes so you can no longer be a part of it or it shuts down or it becomes pay to play or you just don't have the bandwidth anymore. What will you do? What can you do to future proof things? And of course, this is a tiny, tiny example, the Twitter Elon Musk thing compared to some of the stuff that's going on in Europe right now around uh, gas supplies, for example. (laughs) Yes, we're dependent on gas supplies. And when a big player, let's not mention too many words and names and countries, but if a big player turns off the supply, what does that mean for prices? How can we change our behaviour? How, what part of the economy is so dependent on gas or whatever else from another country that it will change the situation entirely? So coming back to what Jane says, it's better to be surprised by a simulation than blindsided by reality. And in fact, this is often why we write fiction. It's to simulate a different reality or to experience a different reality when we read it. And that will help us be better prepared for a different future. So yes, there we go. Those are my thoughts for this week. in useful stuff. Well, if you'd like to learn more about the craft and business of writing, check out the limited time Write Stuff ebook bundle out now, packed full of useful ebooks and a course. It includes publishing pitfalls, writing craft for the working writer, how to use deliberate practice, create a character clinic, free your inner non-fiction writer, do quit your day job. A writer prepares by Lawrence Block. How to write clean first draft writing with Dean Wesley Smith. Plus starting your own business with Christine Catherine Rush and my futurist book, which might give you some future things to consider. Artificial intelligence, blockchain and virtual worlds. And that actually does have a chapter on AI for voice. So check out the bundle now at storybundle.com forward slash writing. Only available until the 10th of May 2022. So this is the last time I will mention it on the podcast. Go get it now, storybundle.com forward slash writing. Also, if you are just getting started out as an indie author and you really need the basics, or if you want to revisit the basics and reset or reboot your indie author career, check out the self-publishing 101 course by Mark Dawson, which opens this week. Join the wait list, depending on when you're listening to this, or check out the course through my affiliate link, thecreativepen.com forward slash 101, 101 thecreativepen.com forward slash 101. Uh, It's a great course and I actually pulled down my own self-publishing basics course uh, off the market because Mark's is better. (laughs) So I definitely believe in promoting better things than my own. And uh, yeah, that self-publishing 101 course is great. Links in the show notes as ever. 
So in my personal update, I have been writing like a maniac on how to write a novel. And uh, I've moved from the kind of overwhelm I had a 90,000 word draft and it was overwhelming me so much and I was trying to put everything about how to write a novel in this book and what I realized is that's absolutely impossible I I actually went through all my bookshelves digital and physical and pulled out all the craft books that I own (laughs) And it is utterly ridiculous. Like it is nearing a hundred craft books that I have now, let alone how many that I've been I've read since I started writing in around two thousand six. And I've done courses. I've done, it, the problem is analysis by paralysis by analysis. That's the one. <laughs> well, and I've just been so overwhelmed by the amount of potential content that I was sort of everything was broken. And now I've found my my stance on it which is I want how to write a novel to touch on everything but not go deep into it and if you've done my how to write a novel course this is kind of what I talk about this idea of the of the iceberg where you you only need to know a few things to write a novel really and then everything else can come later as for the whole rest of your life you can learn what's under the waterline of that iceberg so yeah I'm trying to cut through the noise I think and take people from that sort of oh my goodness there's so much to learn to okay what do you actually need to get this book done and let's get it done Uh, I've also been preparing for my first trip to the USA since before the pandemic. And I am going to a conference in Arizona on the creator economy. And uh, I'm very excited about this. I'm really interested in pretty much every single session that's going on. I'm going to meet some people. And yeah, I will be in Arizona as this goes out. I will be horrifically jet lagged. (laughs) my jet lag is so bad and yes I've tried melatonin and all of that Um, but yeah travel is also more complicated than I expected I have to fill in whoa loads of paperwork um, as well as covid testing etc etc but yeah I think it's worth it. I hope it's worth it. And I'm excited about the conference. And I feel like, yes, I went to New Zealand (laughs) before Christmas, which is the biggest trip you can possibly do from the UK. It is exactly the opposite side of the world. But uh, that was a family trip. And this is a business trip. And I feel like this is my kind of first official big trip away. I'll have lots to report on once I'm back. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments. Angelia Irizari said, OMG, Theodora Taylor, I've never clicked so fast. (laughs) She is awesome. (laughs) And Mika uh, L said on YouTube, Theodora is a great guest. Her interviews are always packed with great useful tips and advice. And finally, Ingmar Albizu said, great interview. Theodora gave great answers. Sadly, the same people who dismiss romance are also quick to dismiss popular fiction, their loss. And uh, I think we all we all probably have genres we dismiss in some way. So yeah, it's always worth examining your opinions about things and where you might be wrong. This is another thing that's come up for me a lot lately is what am I wrong about? And if I'm wrong about something, how big a deal is that? Obviously, we're all wrong about things all the time. (laughs) So I really do like for this show, obviously, I always try and have my sources and I put links in the notes and I try and back everything up, uh, you know, and, and correct things if there is a problem. But of course, we are often wrong about things. So people who dismiss romance, I mean, you can say I don't like reading romance. Personally, I don't like reading romance. I don't read romance. It's not a genre I read. I love thrillers. I love horror. I love dark fantasy as a reader. Um, And when I help my mum write her sweet romances as Penny Appleton, I'm not interested in happy, happy story. (laughs) That's just me, right? So you can say I don't read that genre or I don't read that kind of book. But what you shouldn't dismiss is other writers and the and also readers who choose to read that genre. Readers and writers who choose whatever genre they want, that is their choice. So I think, yeah, respect being respectful of other people's choices, even if you don't agree. <laughs> In fact, that should be the message for Twitter, coming back to that. <laughs> anyway, you can actually tweet me at the creative pen with a double N and uh, send me pictures of where you're listening. You can email me joanna at the creative pen.com or leave a comment on the blog or the YouTube channel. I love to hear from you. It makes this more of a conversation.
So this episode is sponsored by draft to digital and I'll play a word from the lovely Kevin Tomlinson in a minute. I use draft to digital for publishing to libraries and also Nook, as well as the ebook stores, all of the ebook stores for the relaxed author with Mark Leslie Lefebvre as draft to digital do payment splitting. So I'll play that in a minute. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. My time in creating the show is sponsored by my patrons, especially the extra in between episodes. Welcome to new patrons this week, William Marshall, Helen Edwards and Kelly. And thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for months and years. You are all amazing. You can support the show for just a few dollars or whatever your currency is and you will get the extra Q&A audios of which there are now about five years worth and you get the whole backlist. Of course, you don't have to listen to them all. And I just sent out the Q&A for, uh, well, I just did. It's still April as I record this and I just sent out April's Q&A. And I, I answer questions on tons of things. Uh, I answer, you know, answer things on craft and business and personal stuff and uh, future stuff. So yeah, it generally is a, a fun thing. That, I, that patrons get. So you can support the show at patreon.com, P A T R E O N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Draft to Digital, and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, this is Kevin Thompson with Draft to Digital bringing you DDD's smart author tip number 10 Universal Book Links. Maybe you've heard of them. But what you may not know is how these powerful links from books to read just got a whole lot more powerful. Not only can your UBL be customized with a unique URL and include affiliate links for Amazon and other retailers and send your readers to everywhere your ebook is sold online, now it can send them to everywhere that they can buy your audiobook or your paperback or, dare we say it, even the hardcover version of your book. And now you can even include a PayHip link for your book so that you can sell directly to your readers. And like everything else draft to digital builds for you, Universal Book Links are free. And they're only going to get better from here. Universal Book Links just got a whole lot more, well, universal. draft to digital we are self-publishing with support. Find more at d2d.tips slash creative pen. That's pen with two ends, because we're big on the numeral two around here. Elaine Pofelt is an independent journalist specializing in small business and entrepreneurship, as well as an author, editor, and ghostwriter. Elaine was previously on the show in 2020, talking about her previous book, The Million Dollar One Person Business. And today we're talking about her latest book, Tiny Business, Big Money, Strategies for Creating a High Revenue Micro Business. So welcome back to the show, Elaine. Thank you so much, Joanna. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm excited to talk about this. So let's start with your definition. So what is your definition of a tiny business or a micro business? For the purposes of this book, I looked at businesses that were 20 employees or less, but generally speaking, they were five employees or less. And some of them didn't have employees. They just had a recurring team of contractors. What was different from the first book is that if they did use contractors, it wasn't the random contractor here and there. This was a team and the owner of the business had to act as a leader of a team, which is a big transition for a lot of solopreneurs. And I think this is why I wanted to talk to you because that this is exactly what most authors listening, they, I mean, on my business is a tiny business. I'm the only employee, but I have a team of freelancers and I, I manage it all. So what was it that made you want to write this book after the last one? And what is it about micro businesses that made you go, yes, I need to write another book on this? What got me interested in micro businesses was as a business journalist, I noticed that almost all of the coverage on small businesses was about startups that were hoping to scale into the next unicorn. There was very little about the type of business that most people actually aspire to run, which is the solo business. A lot of people are looking for a lifestyle business that allows them to replace their income from a corporate job, but not have the stress. And they don't necessarily want to scale. They like to keep their business small. What I found was after I did the first business, a number of the businesses said, Elaine, we're really sorry, but we hired someone. And I would say 
that's awesome. <laughs> you know, you don't have to apologize to me for hiring somebody. I'm not against growing a business. What I think the challenge was for a lot of them was the leadership part of it. When you start transitioning from being a writer to being a writer with a team, you need to communicate more. And even though communication may be your forte, it's a different type of communication as to what is expected of people on the team. When are the deliverables due? What does good look like? And that sort of thing. And you can lose a little bit of freedom if you don't get it right, because you're then always having to put out fires. So I thought, what can I find out from entrepreneurs who are a step or two ahead of these entrepreneurs in terms of growing their business past the one person stage that will help them to avoid those pitfalls and keep their great lifestyle. And that is what this new book is about. Mm, so much to unpack there. But I, I do want to just come back to you the, the timeline of this, because 2020, when we talked last time to now, which is we're recording this in April 2022. Well, of course, we've had two years of a pandemic, a global pandemic, which is still kind of going on in a lot of places. So how has the pandemic impacted tiny businesses? It's had a huge effect. A lot of them close here in the US, and I'm sure that's true around the world. What, what I found in keeping up with the entrepreneurs in the first book and in learning the stories of the entrepreneurs in the second book was the ones that survived were very diversified. They didn't have just one sales channel. For instance, if they were a brick and mortar business um, that did service, maybe they also had a product. I think writers did pretty well overall because we do digital work to, to some extent. Our, our whole careers are online. But even so, there was some disruption for people in terms of their client base. Maybe some of their clients weren't digitally based and took a hit and therefore didn't need the services that they once did or couldn't afford it. It behooved everybody, I think, to diversify, find new customer pools and really make sure they were optimizing their business so that there was not a lot of waste in it. That, and, and that's what the key to survival was, I think, for many of them. And it's interesting because you mentioned lifestyle and uh, a lifestyle business, which is what I have. I, I'm one of those people also, I don't want to scale in terms of the number of employees. I do want to scale in terms of money, which is why I like that you say a high revenue micro business. But in terms of the lifestyle, we've also heard a lot about the issues with working from home. And obviously people have had childcare. And is, is the fact that is lifestyle business or freedom you also mentioned, is that actually false? It is running your own micro business. Does it really give you these things or do you actually end up just working all the time? A, a lot depends on the systems that you put in place. A lifestyle business can take over your life and it, it be your lifestyle <laughs> if, you're, if you're not careful. But that's where being very conscious is important. Sometimes I, I know I've made the mistake of taking on clients who take far too much time. They're not a good fit for the business. And that can cut into your time with your children or your pets or your hobbies or the other things that matter to you. So you have to be very mindful, I think, in terms of which clients are the right ones for you, which types of products are the most efficient for you, and also setting limits as to when you work and where you work. You can literally work all the time if you're a writer, but that doesn't mean you should. And Part of this goes into planning, you know, just looking at your schedule every week and saying, what time will I block out that is only for fun or only for my family or only for the other things in life? And that forces you to be disciplined and contain the work into other time slots so that it doesn't take over. Yeah. And that is something that I find very hard. And I think a lot of people listening probably find hard too, because everything in life for a writer becomes sort of fodder for the next book, right? If you're writing fiction, it's like, oh, look, there's an interesting character or that setting might go well in my book. And it's, it's really hard to ever turn the brain off. So what are your tips for I guess, writers in particular in terms of the separation between practitioner and business owner? Oh, you're so right about that occupational hazard, Joanna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember as a teenager, my English teacher sent me to a writing conference, and I wish I knew who said this. It was one of the speakers. She said, when you're a writer, nothing is ever wasted. And I think we go into life thinking everything will make a good story, and things can take up a lot of our time that maybe we shouldn't be spending it on if we want to also have a business. So 
I, I think part of it is really having a purpose in your business. I know I work with a business coach. His name is Doug Wick. And um, he's been a great coach for me. He works with middle market companies. And the reason I worked with him, even though my business is much smaller than a middle market company, was he had survived a cancer diagnosis where he had a 2%, less than a 2% chance to live. And he's very focused on what's important. And I thought, my life is totally different from his. I'm a mother with four children. Now they're, my oldest are teenagers. Um, and for me, that's a priority. So saying yes to them means saying no to other things. And no one understands that better than someone who has been basically told their life is over. Luckily, he um, had a stem cell transplant. He survived. And now more than 10 years later, he's fine. But I think keeping that in mind that we, none of us has unlimited time. And we really have to make decisions. If we say yes to one thing, that means we're saying no to doing other things in that time. And I find that's a kind of simple tool to use every time you say yes to things. Sometimes they're worthy. It might be volunteering to do something. But is that a cause that really matters to you? Or are you saying no to a cause that does because you're just randomly doing this thing because it sounds nice to do? That's the kind of thinking you need, I think, to have a balanced life and not let everything take over. But I I find this is part of the problem, though, is that a lot of people coming into, say, the author life, (laughs) they think that the job is writing full time. And we will often hear those of us who are full time writers will hear things like, well, you're not a real full time writer because you don't write all the time. (laughs) And it's I feel like it's a... uh, it's almost a misnomer to say that one is a full-time anything. I mean, you have a lot of different titles as well, but we all have to do different things when we're running a business that is different to the work of the products that go into the business, I suppose. So how, how can we reframe the work of the business as, as in, I mean, it is important. It, it, it does have a priority, right? Well, you need some time to write, but I think getting caught up in what other people think about you as a writer is a trap. The, the proof is in the output, really. So if something took you 80 hours to write or took you one hour, it doesn't really matter. And reminding yourself of that is important because there are so many tools to be more efficient that maybe if your work is taking an inordinate amount of time, that's just because you're not using the best tools. For instance, transcriptions, right? There are all kinds of tools out there that you can use for transcriptions, or you can transcribe yourself. That will add hours to your business and make it full time. But should you be doing that? Or would you be better served by going on a walk in the woods and just letting your mind wander and letting your creativity flow? I think it's almost an industrial era perspective where you were punching a clock. And if you didn't work 37.5 hours a week, you weren't really working. But I think we all need to work on throwing that out the window because we're in the digital age where a lot of things can be done quickly. But that said, it is important to have a regular writing practice or you won't get the results. I'm a really big believer um, that practices like martial arts and yoga, two things that I actually really enjoy are a good model for a writing practice. And interestingly, in the book, Tiny Business, Big Money, I did a survey of the seven-figure entrepreneurs and 80, I think it was 88% exercise and the top exercise was yoga. And I think what these practices teach you is the value of showing up. I mean, you could sit down and write something day after day and nothing good will happen. You just throw it out, delete the file, et cetera. Then one day, somehow as a result of all that work, the magic happens and it all comes together and you solve the writing problem. If you didn't keep showing up, and just showed up on that day, I don't think it would have happened. This is just my belief, because this is what I see with yoga. I I have some moves I've been working on for years. And then there's one called the crow where you're Per, oh, your yeah, hands I know are, that one. You know, the crow, <laughs> right? Like you're perched on your hands and then you put your knees on your elbows. And I used to face plant for two years. I couldn't do it. Then one day, suddenly I came and I could do it. Now I can do it going into a headstand, going back into it, shooting my feet out, you know, doing all these crazy yoga tricks. I never would have believed that I could do it. And I think the reason I can do it is during the pandemic, it was really the only form of exercise with a group that was available to me living in the New York area, my school met outside. So I just went to it more than I usually did. 
And that was when I really got the results. And I think the same is true with writing. The more you do it over and over again, the more proficient you get. But I don't think it matters exactly how many hours. It's more that even if you have just one hour a day that you're really present and you really put your best effort forward, that I think is what uh, really helps. Yeah, I love that. I think that's so important too, and having a practice. And I love that you also mentioned the industrial era perspective. I still struggle with this, or I guess we can also call it the Protestant work ethic. The fact that if you are not putting in 10 hours a day or 12 hours a day, then then clearly you're not working hard enough. And, and I definitely struggle with this. And my husband is very good at finding uh, changing processes so things are more efficient, which is what you mentioned. So you do have tools and things in the book and you mentioned transcription, but what are some of the other tools that you found that you were like, yes, that that's a common thing that people are using in these tiny businesses? Well, one thing that's a, that might be helpful to your listeners would be an exercise that I actually did with my coach, which was to take an Excel spreadsheet or a Google sheet and put in all the hours of the day and actually map out what you're doing, because that will help you to identify time that might be wasted or better spent on something else in the business. I found that tremendously helpful, even if it's not business related. For instance, if you feel like seeing friends would actually make you happier and therefore you'd bring your best self, if for lack of a better phrase, to your business, and you seem to have no time for friends, you might identify that you're spending a certain amount of time at the laundromat or something like that, and you should send your laundry out, and therefore you would have time for friends. It it helps you identify things like that, that you're probably not aware of just because you get into habits and routines, or you can spot things that you're doing out of obligation that maybe no longer serve you. And that you could drop and free time for other things. Um, Sometimes people, I know when my children are younger, sometimes it's hard to run a business when you have small children. You might find that by not doing one other thing, you'll have the time to spend uh, in in your business and make more money. The, The other thing I would recommend is setting income goals because that can free you from some of the constraints of that industrial era thinking. If you say, I need to make $2,000 a week. I'm just throwing that number out there hypothetically. And you've hit the 2,000, then you'll feel less pressure to log the hours because you already achieved the income goal. So shifting your goals to a monetary goal, or it could be an aspirational goal, like getting into a certain publication. Like if I write an article for The Economist, you know, I pitch it successfully and get it published this month. That will be one of my goals. If you set goals like that, that really matter to you, you'll have the sense of progress you need in the business, assuming you're also bringing in income from other things and and meeting your income goals. That that can free you also from that. It's really an employee mindset. And that's one of the things I, I talked about in one of the earlier chapters of the book was the mindset to be an entrepreneur. And a lot of us have been trained to be employees, pretty much most of us, by our schools, by our parents, by every influence that has surrounded us until we enter the work world. So it's no wonder we think that way. And I don't think anyone should beat themselves up for thinking that way. But you almost have to unlearn it and really think about just results. You know, what are the results? And if I can get them quickly, why do I have to follow the rules of doing things? that I learned in a corporate job because I'm not in one anymore. I'll I'll give you an example. I do a lot of different projects for different clients. When I do a project for a corporate client, just to pitch a blog, I would have to create a PowerPoint, maybe involving the art department, just to pitch it to the client. It could take nine months for the blog to get published. 19 people could weigh in on it. (laughs) It will take that much effort because it might be for a big organization where those people all are stakeholders but you don't have to do all those things. There's no point in doing a PowerPoint about a blog if you're doing it one-on-one for a client. So if you think about the processes that you follow, they might be suited for a different business environment than you're now working in as a freelancer. And the more you can weed those out and just focus directly on the work, um, the better off you'll be. And that is part of mindset. It's letting go of this feeling like I have to be the perfect employee and just saying, I have to be the perfect entrepreneur for me and do things my own way. There's actually um, a writer in the book 
Brian Dean, who founded Backlinko, and I actually just reconnected with him. He, he sold the business to SEM Rush, and he had created a course. It came out of an article he wrote about search engine optimization. He's an introvert. He does not like meetings, and he managed the whole business on Notion, and he was able to sell the business to a publicly traded company. So if he can do that, then why do we have to follow all the rules, right? Mm. It's interesting. The rules, are, it's so funny because, of course, most, many of my uh, audience are independent authors and people often say, oh, well, in traditional publishing, there are these types of rules. And then what's happened in the sort of 15 years that I've been in independent publishing is we've ended up making our own rules for a so-called independent movement, which now has these rules in inverted commas, like you must put the book on Amazon and do this on launch week and blah, blah, blah. And of course, there are best practices but how can we use best practices but at the same time not be an employee in that way and just like well that's the rule so we have to follow it there's this tension between best practices and and rules that I don't know do we need to break out of that I I think we do and one way to do it is to reverse engineer your own successes if you look back at your own greatest hits say you got um, an article in a prestigious publication or you sold a book to a publisher or your self-published book was a big hit if you think about the things that led up to that you'll start to identify your own best practices and they may be very different from what you did in corporate one example might be pitching a project somebody who has never pitched a project in an industry will get a book on pitches or find an article on pitches and try to mirror other people's successful pitches and try to use the same subject lines that they use and all that other stuff. But if you've started to build relationships in the industry, maybe the best way to pitch a project is you go out with one of your friends from the industry for a drink and you start talking about work or whatever. And then it just flows naturally into the conversation that you've been wanting to do this article. And then your friend's like, oh, we need an article on that. And they hire you. That's not a formal pitch, but it might've been very effective for you. And what was really effective was that you've taken the time to build relationships in your industry to the point you're really friendly with your clients and you're both helping each other. So if you, if that really is what has worked for you, then doing those other types of pitches is probably a waste of time and where you really need to be doubling down your efforts is going to industry events or making time for coffee with your friends or, or phone catch-ups or whatever is feasible, whatever state of the pandemic we're in. But it's, it's that type of thing that will be a reality check for you to say, hey, wait a minute, I didn't do any of those things that I was told I was supposed to do. And yet this was my biggest placement ever. So I'm going to stick with what, what actually worked for me. And I think that's kind of what Brian Dean did was he found that using Notion, a tech platform, worked really well for him with project management and scaling his business. And there was no need to go on a Zoom meeting or other things that he should, quote unquote, be doing. That didn't work for him. He didn't want to do it. He dreaded it. And he was just going to throw it out the window. And he found a new way to do it. Yeah. And like you said, he's an introvert. And I know a lot of people listening are introverts. I'm an introvert. (laughs) And I just was thinking about relationships there. So you and I, this is the second time we've talked on the phone. (laughs) And I think, I actually think I pitched you for the first time because I heard you on another, or I saw your book come out and I was like, this looks really amazing. Or I heard you on another show. And then this time you reached out to me because we got on last time, right? So you could say we have a acquaintance style relationship, but just from one conversation and a friendly email, we have developed what is happily a nice conversation and also content marketing for us and hopefully useful for the listeners. So I feel like relationships, yes, long-term relationships are really important, but also this kind of connection, let's call it connection rather than a, a relationship, can also be really good, right? Oh, absolutely. I think it's really important, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, to find ways to get to know the people that you work with beyond just the transaction. I think some of us have been taught to focus on every hour that we work to make sure we're getting the most out of each hour in terms of productivity. But I have found, I I love talking with people. I don't know if I'm an introvert or an extrovert. I can't really tell, but I enjoy chatting. You know, I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I remembered it. And I thought of you immediately when I had a new book because I just felt like, 
we enjoyed talking about the last one. But taking, I think, and I think we ran over too, because we had a lot to talk about, Mm -hmm. giving yourself that extra little window to chat with someone and get to know them. And maybe I hear about something that might be useful to you six months from now or make an introduction or whatever, doing those things, you really don't know where they're going to lead. But if you're in an industry where you enjoy the people, it makes it a lot easier. So it might be as a writer, you know, if you find a niche where that is happening for you more, where you just find yourself running over, talking to the people or chatting back and forth, if you prefer text messaging or other types of chatting over talking, that will help you grow your business. It's not necessarily for that reason. I mean, I've made a lot of great friends through my work that I'm friends with outside of anything to do with freelance writing. Now we do all kinds of things. I just like them as people. But Part of it is placing yourself in a niche within your industry where that that will happen. That makes it easier. But then giving yourself that little breathing room to really get to know real human beings Mm -hmm. and develop more of a, whatever you want to call it, relationship or whatever it is, just two human beings connecting around a shared passion. There's, There's a lot of power and energy in that. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, you've talked quite a lot about mindset. And I think another thing is this long term thinking and relationships would also come under that. As you say, you might meet someone at a conference and then two years later, something might come up and you can reconnect again. And I feel also that with growing a small business in every aspect, your craft, relationships, the clients, all of this takes time. So when you were looking at the common mindset issues, how was long term thinking part of that? And also if people struggle with that? What are your tips for developing that long-term thinking? One thing that allows you to do the long-term thinking is putting the right financial foundation in place for your business. And I know that seems removed, but what I've seen time and time again with any type of small business, it could be a writing practice or something else, is if people run out of money, they can't think long-term. They can't think about the big picture projects they'd like to do. Like you do books, books are a long-term project, you can't possibly do a book on a book advance or if you're self-publishing. I mean, unless you get a really, really big advance, you need some other form of income. So maybe you have a day job. Maybe you're doing bread and butter editing or something like that to fund the other stuff. Maybe you live in a really small apartment, so you have the freedom to write. But if you don't have those pieces in place, you just will never have the luxury of getting out of scarcity mode, emergency mode, crisis mode. You'll never have the mental space to be a big picture thinker. So I think that's really important. I think it's also very important to have a peer group to support you. It's very easy to feel alienated if you're only surrounded by people who have traditional jobs because they're following a different life path. Maybe they're planning to retire with a pension or they've had a big 401k or things that are harder for writers to have. So if you surround yourself with successful writers who are navigating those issues too, you'll have other people who are kind of on this journey with you. So you don't abandon the long-term thinking. You know, they find ways, like like a friend of mine is finding a way to take the summer off um, to work on a novel. And she's been wanting to do this for a really long time, but finally she got all the financial pieces lined up. And that's really inspiring to me to think, well, wow, we've been doing the same type of work all these years. She's taken the summer off, something that I have not been able to do with four kids and you know, two of whom are heading to college this year, but it inspired me. And so I think that's important too, is if you can find, even if it's just one friend who's doing the same type of career as you are, it really adds a lot. Yeah, I totally agree with you. And I I blogged every year since I've gone full time, which is coming up for 12 years now. I've blogged my lessons learned from that year. And my lessons learned from year one were exactly that, which was I need some structure. I need a community. I don't know anyone. This is really hard. I want to run back to the day job. And it was meeting other people who were independent authors and who I could talk to, just have a coffee with and go, this is really hard. Why is this so hard? <laughs> and, and that really helped me in that first couple of years. And that's what I, I almost say to people now, that first six months is a bit kind of white knuckle in that you are you don't know what you're doing. You're just trying to, to figure it out. And as you say, having other forms of income is, is really important. But yeah, I, th- I feel like we undervalue that community and you almost just have to reach out in some way, don't you, to find those people. 
you definitely do. And you have to make yourself a little bit vulnerable. But the way I look at it is if somebody doesn't take you up on going out for coffee or a phone call, you have no idea why that is. It could be that they have a personal issue going on. It could be that they're ill. You know, who knows what their situation is? You can't take it personally, although you, maybe it is kind of a personal overture reaching out in friendship. And the more you reach out, the more comfortable you'll get with it. And the more great relationships you'll have and ma- making time every week to do that. It, it might just be reaching out to help people. If you see someone put something on LinkedIn and they need a connection for an article that they're writing, that that can be the start of something something more to find that community of other people like you. I, I think it's really important to have people in your network of all ages too. I think one thing is we, we tend to self-select our own demographic in terms of networking. But as a writer, one thing that I think is important is to see the new ways things are being done. So having younger friends who are, grew up with different technologies is really a, a great asset. I literally just a few minutes ago learned about a, f- a few different technologies from a friend of mine who's really tech savvy. And I'm going to add that I have to test them out and add them to my repertoire. And same thing with older friends, because they may have deep industry knowledge that you don't have about something and or, or a different network than you have, at, or just a different perspective perspective and that I think that's an important thing for any writer also yeah, any absolutely. entrepreneur really for that matter yeah well let's just talk a bit more about money because I wanted to share a quote from the book so this is from the book the difference between a tiny business that makes big money and one that makes average money is often in finding a way to charge premium prices by delivering unusual value and this is a fantastic quote but the problem with most authors listening and you as well you write a book and there is a very clear price range for a book for example so any tips on uh, that sort of turning things into big money for authors and writers? A, a book is often a calling card, but it may not be the way that you make the six-figure or seven-figure income. For most people, it won't be because I think we both know a lot of writers, how many really do just from the book alone. I mean, if you really strike it hot and get lucky, or if you have a number of books and you're starting to get royalties every year, or you have self-published books, and as a group, they start bringing in that kind of revenue, that's that's more achievable. But you, I think you, one area to look at is other ancillary products. For instance, you could do a course. Um, what, one of the writers in the book, her name is Laura Belgray. You may know her. She's a copywriter. She's very funny. And she was actually making... $1,450 US dollars per hour for her services, which is probably 10 times what most people would make. And she found it to be a lot of pressure because when people are paying you that kind of money, you really have to perform in that hour. So she decided to create, well, she had some two PDF courses about copywriting. One of them was about how to create your About Us page. And she wasn't really marketing them very heavily. So she worked with a business coach and he said, what if you sent out your email newsletter three times a week and promoted these more? And she already had created them. She hired a designer to make them look nice, but they were not, they were very low tech. Um, And then she also started a mastermind about copywriting and she made it a point to include people from different industries. So there was really interesting chemistry in this mastermind. And it was a combination of everything that brought her to seven figures. And then she wound up very rarely doing the hourly work anymore, even though it paid well, it was just too stressful. And that's where she is now. And she was actually, the last time I spoke with her, she was working on a book, which sounded really funny. And I think she's got a really good model. Another entrepreneur in the book, he's also a copywriter, Dana Derricks. And he lives on a goat farm. It seems like it's more of a um, hobby type farm in, in Wisconsin and children visit it and that sort of thing. But he has this copywriting business and he actually scaled it to the point where he had employees. He didn't like having employees because of all the compliance. And then he went back to more of a freelance team. But what he does is high ticket books where he sells books to his clients 
related to copywriting, but he prices them based on the value of the information. And he started with a $400 book and he sold over a thousand copies of that. And then he kept upping the ante a little bit. And it seemed that he maybe topped out at $1,500 per book. And then it's, there was a point of diminishing returns. But I thought that was an interesting mindset to think about, well, wow, if they applied all the information in this book, it would be worth at least $400 to them. And they, he had takers. So that might be something else to think about. Is there a convention in your industry that makes no sense to you about how things are priced? I mean, there is the reality of what the market will bear. Like if you're doing copy editing, I don't think you can charge $2,000 an hour for that, but maybe you could do a copy editing course Mm. or, you know, how to become a copywriter in a weekend retreat at your nice apartment somewhere. (laughs) And and, and there are a lot of examples of this in the book of people taking their knowledge and turning it into a product it's not an overnight thing. All of these things require product development, but that's where um, what you had mentioned about long-term thinking, Joanna, is is so important because that will allow you to say, okay, I want to introduce my PDF course on whatever this year. So I need to have every Friday off to work on it. Therefore, I'm going to take on this really high paying bread and butter work to finance that, even though I'm not going to be taking in any money from it the first year. Um, thinking, doing it one step at a time instead of trying to do nine things at once seems to be the way that a lot of these folks work, by the way, mm. because otherwise you spread yourself too thin and then nothing gets done. And you, there's sort of a negative energy, I think, that comes from having unfinished products, projects. And this gives you those wins so that you feel there is momentum. And you also learn, like if you release a product, or a mastermind and nobody signs up, maybe your pricing is wrong or you've named it the wrong thing or you release it the wrong time of year. You have an opportunity to learn from the first one and then use that to make the next one better. Yeah. And I think so much there about it's learning about yourself. It's learning about the product. And then of course your life changes. You know, I've been doing this, as I said, for 15 years and my business model has changed multiple times because things change. And so you decide to pivot into a new way and you try something else. And, and I think that's probably another, the long-term thing is to have a business for the long term. It doesn't mean you set up a business and it just stays like that until you die. <laughs> I mean, things, no, things change, right? It, yeah, in the whole market might change the demand for certain things. I know in my business, I started out just doing freelance journalism. And then there was a demand for um, content writing that started taking off. And I added that on. And then in the Great Recession, some of the journalism dried up. And I, I got more heavily into copywriting and marketing. And then when things came back, then I was really busy. But I realize it made sense to switch to adding some retainer clients to have more of a steady income instead of project by project. So then I, I emphasize those clients, some of whom became book clients, we would do the content and then that kind of morphed into books. And now uh, probably the majority of my income comes from ghostwriting books. And interestingly, it's not intentional, but the fact that I write books attracts the right type of clients to me because they like my writing style on my own books. And they can very easily see if we have a similar mindset or not just by reading the books. And so that's been kind of an interesting thing that's happened that I didn't expect. I don't know if you you may have found that too for you. Mm, I don't do any ghostwriting, but it it is interesting how we pivot over time. But we're almost out of time ourselves. And I did want to ask you, because you do have two nonfiction books under your own name. And in terms of book marketing, because people are always interested, like, how do you market a book? So what have you found works best for your nonfiction? Well, for me personally, I have found podcasting to be a really great engine for meeting people that are genuinely interested in the types of things that I write about because podcasts are so niche that people won't listen to a podcast if they're really not interested in the topic. And they also have to self-select the topic. Like if they see tiny business, big money, and they have no interest in running a business, they won't even listen to it. So it, it brings to me a lot of the types of people that will enjoy my books and a lot of them become friends. Also live events have been really helpful for me. With my first book, I did a lot of live events where I would do panel discussions with the entrepreneurs that I profiled in the book. And I found 
that was so powerful. I couldn't believe how powerful it was sometimes. Like I would do events at the New York Public Library and there would be people out the door, like over 200 people coming to these free events on a Thursday night to talk to the actual entrepreneurs. And I think it's because they're regular people just like anyone else. And yet they've achieved these great results and people actually want to see them and talk to them and hear from them. And they can say it better than I ever can because they're talking about their own lives. So that that was very effective. And I think I will be resuming that again now that the weather is a little warmer and we can do meetings safely. I've been holding off a little bit with the pandemic. I'm in the New York area, but I think the timing is right to get people back together. So for folks that are in a part of the world where that's feasible right now, that might be another option. I mean, Zoom events and things like that can also be helpful in terms of reaching a more global audience. And I do do a lot of Zoom events, but I, I feel like at this point in the pandemic, a lot of people are screened out. You know, they, they don't want to look at another Zoom call. So I do it sparingly, only if I feel like the event will really reach people that are genuinely interested in what I what I write about. Brilliant. So where can people find you and your books online? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook under my full name, Elaine Pofeld, and that's in the show notes, the spelling, or on um, Instagram at Million Dollar One Person Business. I do write back. It makes me a better journalist to know what you're curious about or to know your story. Sometimes I end up covering people that I hear from in that way. And the book is available on major bookstores, Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble, and all the other major bookstores. I have a website, tinybusinessbigmoney.com that has links to the bookstores that carry it. So uh, do reach out. I, I hope to hear from you. And I really appreciate that the listeners have tuned in. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Elaine. That was great. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate the show. Uh, you do so much for the writing community. So thank you. So I hope you found the interview with Elaine thought provoking. I certainly struggle with working all the time, it's all more than I should. And I definitely need to review my systems again. Part of my trip to Arizona is thinking about how I want the next 15 years of my business to go. And I'm sure I'll be sharing some of that with you. So next week, it's back to craft as I discuss writing a successful crime thriller series with Angela Marsons, as well as breaking through the barriers that hold us back and why she loves her traditional publisher so much. So that's coming next week. And in the meantime, happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.